introduce myself. I'm Patrick Richardson. I'm with the City of Quebec here. I'm the Planning and Redevelopment Director. And we have a good presentation for you tonight. This is the second workshop for the Jefferson Corridor Study Area. I'm really glad to see such a good turnout, especially now that we're in the middle of the holiday season. So without much further ado, I'll turn it over to Pat with MIG, and we'll get the program started. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, Great to see such a wonderful crowd here tonight. And by the way, there are plenty of chairs, so this is not a standing room only crowd tonight. Um, so I wanted to get a sense, first of all, of how many of you were at the first visioning workshop. If you could just raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a good mix of people who have been here, here before and people who are new. Uh, what I'd like to do is, first of all, just quickly go over the agenda, and then just give you just a, a couple minutes, maybe about five minutes of of background uh, for those of you who weren't here the first time and then we'll get into the meat of our agenda which is we're going to be actually be talking about urban design and placemaking and Frank Miller who's the consultant who's working on the specific plan is going to share some information with you but most of the evening is going to be getting your input and your thoughts and, and your ideas about uh, for example around a case study that's at the Staper Brothers site and uh, what I'd like to do is try to figure out, first of all, um, I want to slide here. Okay, so um, what we'd like to do tonight is uh, just, I'll go over the study purpose and background, uh, go over just a few of the highlights of what we heard last time, and then um, we'll have, as I mentioned, a presentation by Frank Miller talking about uh, urban design and what we call placemaking, and then um, look at the, uh, opportunities for urban design and placemaking in the study area and I think many of you are familiar with the study area but we also have large maps at each place that show you um, they outline what the study area is and what we'd like to do throughout the evening is to encourage you if you have comments or specific thoughts about what might fit certain places or comments that are lend themselves to the map to be sure to mark up that map and we'll be taking those with us and, and using them for input. And then we're gonna finally wrap up with uh, talking about the next step in the process. Uh, the objectives of the study are to develop a, vi a vision that's really community-based for this area and uh, to look at how to really enhance the property values to retain and enhance the economic vitality and also to tie into having better mobility in the area. And last time we heard about the need for, for example, more east-west connections in the area. Um, so the question is why now? And, and actually Katie did a great job of going over this last time. I'd actually probably prefer to have her come up and go over it for you. But um, first of all, there's aging commercial development. A lot of it's um, sometimes 20, 30 years old. And also the development standards are outdated and they're not nearly as flexible as they are these days and they don't, and they don't necessarily lend themselves to more creative ideas. And also, even though we're in a downturn, it's really a chance to take a look at the properties here and really set the stage for that economic upturn that we know always happens, especially with land. I think many of you who've been through various property cycles know that, well, this is a very unusual time that this property cycle, where it's really down, will end and there'll be an upgrade. And uh, also uh, yeah. tie into some of those planned infrastructure improvements. There are interchanges planned, there are major roadways planned, and there's also an overall historic Highway 295 corridor study that's going on that really went between Elsinore, uh, Wildemar, Marietta, and Temecula. And to really create a whole regional synergy here among uh, the cities in that corridor. So uh, the visioning process looks at where we are now and where we want to be, and then develops a framework and strategies for getting to that place that we want to be. So it really has specific, it leads to specific concrete steps that lead to a specific, specific, uh, a specific plan for the Jefferson uh, area. So where we are now, uh, as I mentioned, we started out with looking at existing conditions, vision, opportunities, and challenges. And today we're going to look at urban design and placemaking. 
And then in January, we're going to look at transportation in the corridor and what the needs are. We're going to look at what's called complete streets and in plain English, that's basically multi-use streets that don't just accommodate cars, but also can handle pedestrians and bicycles and really enhance the neighborhood. And we're going to look at parking and land use. And then in March, we're going to get into some more nitty gritty where we're looking at alternative development scenarios uh, getting economists in here to look at what we've come up with and look at the market feasibility, what might provide in this area, what might be really feasible, and then how to work with economic development. And then in May, we'll be moving into the final vision report into the summer, which then will lead to development of the specific plan itself, which will outline those, uh, as it says, specific plans, specifics in terms of land use, zoning, uh, how things are envisioned to fit together. So uh, we have a website now up and running. It's uh, envisionjefferson.org. And it's actually, there's a link on the city's website. So you don't have to memorize this URL, but it's, it's pretty easy. It's envisionjefferson.org. And it's a place where you can get the calendar of events. There'll be documents, including, like, for example, uh, last time's presentation is already on there, and tonight's presentation will be. The wall graphics that we have copies of will be on there. You'll be able to discuss your ideas on there. And if you sign up, the website will notify you when new information is posted on the site but you'll be able to set your preferences so that you won't be barraged with, I know some of us are on sites where we're barraged with information uh, 30 times a day uh, from people posting information. So uh, the key findings on workshop number one, I'm not gonna go over our wall graphic, but this is what Andy Pandoli, our project manager and also graphic recorder, will be producing one of these tonight as we did last time. Uh, the visions that we heard were that this should be an exciting destination that has a really unique character, but fits in with the overall area and is one of the economic engines of Temecula and uh, has a way of organizing itself so that it's not just a strip of miscellaneous, but it has distinct districts, perhaps a creek front district, perhaps a uh, an agricultural or goods district, perhaps an arts district. Those were visions that came up. Uh, there's one of the key things we heard was that there's a need to activate this area day and night. And I think we heard from some of the hotel owners, for example, that they'd like to have a place where people feel that they can actually go out in this corridor at night and also during the day and have things that their kids can do. Uh, and it really supports both local needs and visitors. It's not just for one or the other, but it's for everybody. And it really gives a positive and desirable feel to the area so that people are drawn to the area and want to come to it. Uh, also, it's going to create jobs. It has to be, people want it to be a place that creates jobs, that really spurs economic development, that really draws some of that development you know, in addition to being on the east side of the freeway, also on the west side of the freeway. And uh, improving the circulation, uh, that one of the key things we heard was again about the east-west uh, mobility, but also um, it just improves the overall safety because Frank will be getting into some of the street types later, but right now what we have is essentially for the most part a four-lane road with a median and kind of mixed access along that, along that road. Uh, some of the challenges we heard were that, uh, first of all, how can, how can we in Temecula get a really realistic plan that can be implemented and not some general vision? And uh, the challenge is just bringing more people into the area because people tend to just come in and out for their specialty need and may not necessarily stay in the area. Um, addressing the traffic and circulation issues um, without offending anybody who might have a tattoo part or anything, uh, addressing in incompatible uses or things, really looking at what the uses should be in this area, whatever they are, and then getting uses that complement each other. And then um, having appropriate building heights. We heard 
Actually, some people said, why don't we have high rises in this area? But more people also said, well, we do need a mix of building heights. We can't just all be one story. We need to have a mix of building heights. So there are a lot of opportunities. And uh, having a range of district heights, uh, getting a unique character to the area, really having an identity for this area. Um, using incentives to attract those kinds of desirable businesses and ones that would complement your businesses to the area and to help expand the tourism-based uses beyond Old Town and getting into this area as well because again, we have, for example, the creek front that could be a major attractor and improving some of those areas that are underutilized and you'll hear about a case study of one of those tonight, which is the old Shader Brothers site. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on this as to whether we heard you correctly last time, those of you who were here, or whether you have any questions about the rest of the night? Because if you don't, I'm going to turn it over to Frank Miller, who's going to uh, give us all an education in urban design and placemaking. So Frank. Thank you, Pat. Um, The Jefferson Corridor is a, in my view, a terrific opportunity. And I remember back in the 80s when, whenever I would come through, the Jefferson Corridor was a very energetic, lively place. It was sort of the center of commercial activity, which meant to us. Uh, and then Old Town had the role that it played more as a tourist uh, hub. And then the mall came. And then Jefferson Corridor had, uh, I'm not sure, used to your opinion about what has happened since the mall went in, but um, it's, I think it, it stands as an opportunity in front of us now to think of and explore concepts for the future growth of Jefferson Quarter, which is different than Old Town, and which is different from the mall, but kind of an area that can add uh, opportunities for, for business and as tourist destinations that are different than those other areas. And as such, I think um, it's a tough challenge, but uh, as part of exploring those ideas, what I'd like to do is to do two things. One is give you kind of an introduction to some of the urban design ideas that we typically think about when we plan areas. And then number two, we have, with the uh, permission of the principal landowners, of the State of Brothers site, develop some redevelopment concepts uh, for that site. And we want to present those and show you how we apply some of those design ideas. So um, I think I control the uh, slide. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, um, first, a couple definitions. Urban design is the art in Art of creating and shaping cities. I'll keep these very, very brief. And placemaking strives to create a sense of place that is memorable and distinct. And the concept of placemaking um, will, will continue to define as we go through the evening. Thank you. Um, and um, with that, the, the primary elements of urban design and placemaking that we'll, we'll be talking about are the buildings, the streets, the public open spaces, the transportation opportunities in addition to what happens on the street, whether that's for bikes or for light rail or high-speed rail, um, and landscaping uh, characteristics. The tradition of town planning in the United States really began with the image on the right, and that is what we call today traditional neighborhood or community development. And it's characterized by a grid of streets that's off of an arterial. And um, I'm gonna, those on that side of the room, you'll forgive me if I point from here. Um, for example, if you live in one of these little houses in the upper right hand corner, and you wanna get down to, let's say, the grocery store, you just walk down the street and you get to it and you have a couple of different routes that you can travel. Um, 
On the left is a situation actually more characteristic of Highway 79 South than Jefferson Corridor, where there's an arterial, and then there are retail anchor stores, there are subdivisions. The subdivisions are usually separated uh, by larger houses and the subdivision with smaller houses, um, shopping centers, office parks, and so forth. Um, and then if you live in a condition on the left, if you want to go from your house here to the grocery store, you, you end up having to go on the arterial. And traditionally in America, what that's created is enormous traffic on arterial. And the loss of interconnected streets has created traffic problems, which we spend a lot of money and effort and time trying to solve. So the, 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 um, this is the normal, on the left, is the normal development scenario since World War II. Prior to World War II, most new development happened uh, more or less on the model that's shown on the right. Now, the, a the couple of photographs which illustrate the kinds of conditions that you get um, with that separation of uses. Okay, urban design and placemaking. Uh, I'm gonna kind of boil down the urban design concept, and, and I have to ask a question before I speak. Other than consultants and staff, are there any uh, members of the public who have a background in urban design or planning or placemaking? Okay. Uh, the, the first one is the, the building placement on lot. Second issue is building form. Third is frontage types. And the fourth are streets. Uh, number one, the building placements on lots, and broadly what this turns into is a discussion of how the buildings are used to define the public realm. How close are they to the street, for example? And in Old Town, I think all of you are familiar with the fact that the original building was built before 1930. All the front of the building touched the property line. And then, uh, and it was sort of an unspoken, I don't think the county had any uh, ordinance that said the building has to touch the property line. That was the natural instinct throughout most of American history to get commercial buildings right up to the street, get your glass in the front, and get yourself close to the customers. The, in, the, in the old town case, the balconies and porches were built into the right of way, and then some years later, the county deeded that extra 10 feet of space back to the private landowner so that all those improvements were not on county property. Um, the, and what you get when you do that is a clearly defined street edge, where the buildings help define the space of the street. That's in the photo. This illustrates, on the left, the Jefferson Corridor at the Stater Brothers site, and on the right, another town in California. The, they're at the same scale. Both streets are four-lane arterials, with parallel parking on the sides. And I think they both have medians. You're doing one the right, Debbie. The, the Jefferson Corridor was developed during a period of time when defining the street with buildings was not the common practice. It's a post-World War II development. Um, and as such, what tended to happen were the idea of setbacks. That is, the building, in fact, is supposed to be set back a certain distance from the street as opposed to what we refer to as built to lines, which is to say that the building, in fact, has to come forward to a line that's very close to the street. The, the town on the right clearly was built before World War II, where the building was, um, as in the old town and many small towns that you will have visited, um, all come close to the street. <clears throat> building form. Um, this could also be referred to as building massing, and I've just shown four examples of building forms. Um, and these are independent of architecture. Uh, a two-story block, a three-story block, a three-story block with a fourth floor that's set back from the street, and a three-story block with what we call a forecourt, which is kind of a courtyard carved out of it on the street edge. <clears throat> If you take those simple building forms, you can combine those together to create a streetscape. 
And right there is you know, 90 percent of American cities um, where the buildings are close to the street. The um, with very few building types, you can get a lot of variety. The, the third concept is frontage type. <clears throat> and this is separate from the, the building. Frontage type is from the front face of the building mass forward into the street. There are different kinds of treatments and designs that you can create. The one on the left is what we call a shop front. And that's the most common in commercial areas where the buildings are close to the street. And often there are awnings and canopies um, attached to the face of the building. There's a little cross section below each uh, sketch. The second one is what we call a gallery. You see a lot of those in Old Town, very common uh, coast to coast here. Um, and the next one shows a two-story gallery. You see that coming in too. The third one is the forecourt. So the forecourt kind of lives both in the world of building form and in the world of building frontage. Um, the third one is the arcade, typically the first floor set back and the second floor um, hangs over it. For example, the Palomar Hotel and Old Town is an example of an arcade. You can walk underneath the second floor. And the third one, third furnace type is the stoop, which is primarily a residential furnace type. So if you combine building forms with these frontage types, for example, on the upper left, if you started with a three-story block and then you go down, you can say you can show the same block with a gallery, you go down again, and you see the same block with an arcade. Um, the most buildings, 90% of the buildings you'll find urban America are, are these types of combinations. And then furthermore, if you combine different building forms with different frontage types attached to them, you can create, with very few elements, you can create very lively and very diverse kinds of buildings. Now again, notice this sketch, for example, could be architecturally, it could be a variety of um, Spanish colonial, it could be neo, classical, it could be modern. This discussion is really kind of independent of architectural style. And that is a very important part of urban design and placemaking. We won't talk about that tonight. We'll, we'll touch that in a future uh, workshop. Now, based on what I just showed you, the one on the upper left is a shop front, in this case with a canopy. The left on the bottom shows a commercial building, a three-story block that has a three-story gallery at the far end, and then a two-story gallery a little closer. Upper right shows a building that has a two-story gallery on the far end and an arcade at the front end. And then lower right shows a kind of an upside-down arcade. It's, I suppose, a two-story block where the second floor is pushed back from the top a little bit, and then there's a gallery in there. So with these very few simple elements, you can create a great deal of diversity. And then if you add architectural style onto that, um, you get even more diversity. So that's, that, that is one of the ways that I use when I'm looking at pictures of streets um, or when I travel to a place. I try to, try to sort of deep unpack it and say, okay, what's the basic building form? What are the frontage types? And then what's the architectural style that's attached to that? Okay, the fourth, fourth um, topic is streets. And these are the four um, issues I'll, I'll talk about. Street grids, the block size, interconnected streets, street types, and then some examples of four lane arterials, which is what Jefferson Avenue is, of course. This is an image that shows the Jefferson Avenue study area on the left with an insert of Old Town at the same scale. It gives you a sense that, you know, Old Town is kind of a long walk um, in the way it is sort of gate to gate. Um, Jefferson Corridor is like at least four of those long. And it really begs the question, um, uh, with such a large area, what are the opportunities create different sorts of districts or areas of different character along that whole two plus mile um, 
plane. The smaller blocks, traditionally, in the world of real estate, um, create more frontage, which create more opportunity for customers to walk by your front door. It tends to increase the value of the property. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Old Town it, it sells for the, the real estate price per square foot that it sells for, whatever that is this year. Um, and it begs the question, in the future, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years out in, in the Jefferson Corridor, is it, what are the opportunities to make smaller blocks? Is that desirable? And this is something that we're going to want you to think about and give us feedback on as we go forward. Another issue is wayfinding. Um, I'm pretty good at finding my way around Jefferson Corridor, but Old Town is, is real simple. Now, of course, it's for its size, so it's sort of not fair, but the street alignments in the Jefferson Corridor do not make it easy for first-time uh, visitors to find a way around, and that wayfinding uh, is an issue that needs to be thought about in the future. Here's a comparison at the same scale. So on the left is Old Town, and one of the ways we um, measure blocks is the, the actual dimensions of them. Old Town's 300 by 400 feet, and the, the walking distance around them. If you park, want to walk around the block, the Old Town lot size is, is very pedestrian friendly. Um, in the Jefferson Corridor, what I'll call the Stater Brothers block, uh, the perimeter is over a mile long, and it's, it's 39 acres in size. Um, by contrast, what I'll call the right of way block, which is sort of behind there at the end of um, uh, Oberlin, um, is you know a half a mile around and six acres uh, or so. Um, the the, short, the the smaller block size is more pedestrian friendly, and this is part of this equation of the future of Jefferson Corridor in thinking about how pedestrian friendly you want it to be. The next slide shows the concept of interconnected streets, another discussion point for the future of this corridor. On the left is the existing condition. There's really only, there, there's strong north-south connectivity. Diaz, Jefferson Avenue, the freeway, Inez, and so forth. East-west, there's only three ways across at the moment. Winchester, Overland, and Rancho California. In the future, the city plans and I think you're aware of uh, the new interchange at Cherry on the north edge, which will end, result eventually with the connection east-west. Um, the fact that Overland will continue across the creek to the west side, and then some uh, 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 another crossing down toward Rancho Way. The alignment of that one is unclear at the moment. Um, so, and we have a good presentation for you tonight. This is the second workshop for the Jefferson Corridor study area. I'm really glad to see such a good turnout, especially now that we're in the middle of the holiday season. So without much further ado, I'll turn it over to Pat with MIG, and we'll get the program started. OK, thanks, Patrick. Uh, it's great to see such a wonderful crowd here tonight. And by the way, there are plenty of chairs, so this is not a standing room only crowd tonight. Um, so I want to get a sense, first of all, of how many of you were at the first visioning workshop, if you could just raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a good mix of people who have been here, here before and people who are new. Uh, what I'd like to do is, first of all, just quickly go over the agenda and then just give you just a, a couple minutes, maybe about five minutes of, of background uh, for those of you who weren't here the first time. And then we'll get into the meat of our agenda, which is we're going to be actually be talking about urban design and placemaking. And Frank Miller, who's the consultant who's working on the specific plan, is going to share some information with you, but most of the evening is going to be getting your input and your thoughts and, and your ideas about, uh, for example, around a case study that's at the Staver Brothers site. And uh, what I'd like to do is try to figure out, first of all, um, I want to slide here. Okay. So, um, what we'd like to do tonight is uh, just I'll go over the study purpose and background, uh, go over just a few of the highlights of what we heard last time, and then um, 
We'll have, as I mentioned, a presentation by Frank Miller talking about uh, urban design and what we call placemaking. And then um, look at the uh, opportunities for urban design and placemaking in the study area. And I think many of you are familiar with the study area, but we also have large maps at each place that show you, um, they outline what the study area is. And what we'd like to do throughout the evening is to encourage you, if you have comments or specific thoughts about what might fit certain places or comments that are lend themselves to the map, to be sure to mark up that map and we'll be taking those with us and, and using them for input. And then we're gonna finally wrap up with uh, talking about the next step in the process. Uh, the objectives of the study are to develop a, vi a vision that's really community-based for this area and uh, to look at how to really enhance the property values to retain and enhance the economic vitality and also to tie into having better mobility in the area. And last time we heard about the need for, for example, more east-west connections in the area. Um, so the question is why now, and, and actually Katie did a great job of going over this last time, and actually probably prefer to have her come up and go over it for you, but um, first of all, there's aging commercial development. A lot of it's um, sometimes 20, 30 years old, and also the development standards are outdated, and they're not nearly as flexible as they are these days, and they don't, they don't necessarily lend themselves to more creative ideas. And also, even though we're in a downturn, it's really a chance to take a look at the properties here and really set the stage for that economic upturn that we know always happens, especially with land. I think many of you who've been through various property cycles know that, well, this is a very unusual time that this property cycle, where it's really down, will end and there'll be an upgrade. And uh, also uh, tie into some of those planned infrastructure improvements. There are interchanges planned, there are major roadways planned, and there's also an overall historic Highway 395 corridor study that's going on that really went between Elsinore, uh, Wildemar, Marietta, and Temecula. And really create a whole regional synergy here among uh, the cities in that corridor. So uh, the visioning process looks at where we are now and where we want to be, and then develops a framework and strategies for getting to that place that we want to be. So it really has specific, at least the specific concrete steps that lead to a specific, specific, uh, a specific plan for the Jefferson uh, area. So where we are now, uh, as I mentioned, we start out with looking at existing conditions, vision, opportunities, and challenges. And today we're going to look at urban design and placemaking. And then in January, we're going to look at transportation in the corridor and what the needs are. We're going to look at what's called complete streets. And in plain English, that's basically multi-use streets that don't just accommodate cars, but also can handle pedestrians and bicycles and really enhance the neighborhood. And we're going to look at parking and land use. And then in March, we're going to get into some more nitty gritty where we're looking at alternative development scenarios, uh, getting economists in here to look at what we've come up with and look at the market feasibility, what might provide in this area, what might be really feasible, and then how to work with economic development. And then in May, we'll be moving into the final vision report into the summer, which then will lead to development of the specific plan itself, which will outline those, uh, as it says, specific plans, specifics in terms of land use, zoning, uh, how things are envisioned to fit together. So uh, we have a website now up and running. It's uh, envisionjefferson.org. And it's actually, there's a link on the city's website. So you don't have to memorize this URL, but it, it's pretty easy, it's envisionjefferson.org. And it's a place where you can get the calendar of events. There'll be documents including, like for example, uh, last time's presentation is already on there and tonight's presentation will be, the wall graphics that we have copies of will be on there. 
you'll be able to discuss your ideas on there and if you sign up the website will notify you when new information is posted on the site but you'll be able to set your preferences so that you won't be barraged with, I know some of us are on sites where we're barraged with information uh, 30 times a day uh, from people posting information. So uh, the key findings of workshop number one, I'm not gonna go over our wall graphic, but this is what Andy Pandoli, our project manager and also graphic recorder will be producing one of these tonight as we did last time. Uh, the visions that we heard were that this should be an exciting destination that has a really unique character, but fits in with the overall area and is one of the economic engines of Temecula and uh, has a way of organizing itself so that it's not just a strip of miscellaneous, but it has distinct districts, perhaps a creek front district, perhaps a uh, an agricultural or goods district, perhaps an arts district, those were visions that came up. Uh, there's, it, one of the key things we heard was that there's a need to activate this area day and night. And I think we heard from some of the hotel owners, for example, that they'd like to have a place where people feel that they can actually go out in this corridor at night and also during the day and have things that their kids can do. Uh, and it really supports both local needs and visitors. It's not just for one or the other, but it's for everybody. And it really gives a positive and desirable feel to the area so that people are drawn to the area and want to come to it. Uh, also, it's going to create jobs. It has to be, people want it to be a place that creates jobs, that really spurs economic development, that really draws some of that development you know, in addition to being on the east side of the freeway, also on the west side of the freeway. And uh, improving the circulation, uh, that one of the key things we heard was again about the east-west uh, mobility, but also um, it just improves the overall safety because Frank will be getting into some of the street types later, but right now what we have is essentially for the most part a four lane road with a median and kind of mixed access along that, along that road. Uh, some of the challenges we heard were that, uh, first of all, how can, how can we in Temecula get a really realistic plan that can be implemented and not some general vision? And uh, the challenge is just bringing more people into the area because people tend to just come in and out for their specialty need and may not necessarily stay in the area. Um, addressing the traffic and circulation issues um, without offending anybody who might have a tattoo part or anything, uh, addressing incompatible in uses or things, really looking at what the uses should be in this area, whatever they are, and then getting uses that complement each other. And then um, having appropriate building heights. We heard actually some people said, why don't we have high rises in this area? But more people also said, well, we do need a mix of building heights. We can't just all be one story. We need to have a mix of building heights. So there are a lot of opportunities. And uh, having a range of district heights, uh, getting a unique character to the area, really having an identity for this area. Um, using incentives to attract those kinds of desirable businesses and ones that would complement your businesses to the area and to help expand the tourism-based uses beyond Old Town and getting into this area as well, because again, we have, for example, the creek front that could be a major attractor, and improving some of those areas that are underutilized, and you'll hear about a case study in one of those tonight, which is the old Shader Brothers site. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on this as to whether we heard you correctly last time, those of you who were here, or whether you have any questions about the rest of the night. Because if you don't, I'm going to turn it over to Frank Miller, who's going to uh, give us all an education in urban design and placemaking. So Frank. Thank you, Pat. Um, the Jefferson Corridor is a, in my view, a terrific opportunity. And I remember back in the 80s when, whenever I would come through, the Jefferson Corridor was a very 
energetic, lively place. It's sort of the center of commercial activity, which you might like. Um, and then Old Town had the role that it played more as a tourist uh, hub. And then the mall came. And then Jefferson Corridor had, uh, I'm not sure of you in your opinion about what has happened since the mall went in, but um, it's, I think, it, it stands as an opportunity in front of us now to think of and explore concepts for the future growth of Jefferson Quarter, which is different than Old Town, and which is different from the mall, but kind of an area that can add uh, opportunities for, for business and as tourist destinations and so forth that are different than the other areas. And as such, I think um, it's a tough challenge, but uh, as part of exploring those ideas, what I'd like to do is to do two things. One is give you kind of an introduction to some of the urban design ideas that we typically think about when we plan areas. And then number two, we have, with the uh, permission of the principal landowners of the State of Brothers site, developed some redevelopment concepts uh, for that site. And we want to present those and show you how we apply some of those urban design ideas. So um, I think I control the uh, slide. Is that true? Yeah. Can you take a seat? Um, first, a couple definitions. Urban design is the art, in, uh, art of creating and shaping cities. I'll keep these very, very brief. And placemaking strives to create a sense of place that is memorable and distinct. And the concept of placemaking um, will, will continue to define as we go through the evening. Thank you. Um, and, um, with that, the, the primary elements of urban design and placemaking that we'll, we'll be talking about are the buildings, the streets, the public open spaces, the transportation opportunities in addition to what happens on the street, whether that's for bikes or for light rail or high-speed rail, um, and landscaping uh, characteristics. The, Tradition of town planning in the United States really began with the image on the right, and that is what we call today traditional neighborhood or community development. And it's characterized by a grid of streets that's off of an arterial. And um, I'm gonna, those are, on that side of the room, you'll forgive me if I point from here. Um, for example, if you live in one of these little houses in the upper right hand corner, and you want to get down to, let's say, the grocery store, you just walk down the street and you get to it. And you have a couple of different routes that you can travel. Um, on the left is a situation actually more characteristic of Highway 79 South than Jefferson Corridor, where there's an arterial, and then there are retail anchor stores, there are subdivisions. The subdivisions are usually separated uh, by larger houses and subdivision with smaller houses, um, shopping centers, office parks, and so forth. Um, and then if you live in a condition on the left, if you want to go from your house here to the grocery store, you, you end up having to go on the arterial. And traditionally in America, what that's created is enormous traffic on arterial. And the loss of interconnected streets has created traffic problems which we spend a lot of money and effort and time trying to solve. So the, 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 um, this is the normal, on the left, is the normal development scenario since World War II. Prior to World War II, most of the development happened uh, more or less on the model that's shown on the right. Now, the, a uh, couple of photographs which illustrate the kinds of conditions that you get um, with that separation of uses. Okay, urban design and placemaking. Uh, I'm gonna kind of boil down the urban design concept, and, and I have to ask a question before I proceed. Other than consultants and staff, are there any 
uh, members of the public who have a background in building design or planning or placemaking? Okay. Uh, the, the first one is the, the building placement on lot. Second issue is building form. Third is frontage types. And the fourth are streets. Uh, number one, the building placements on lots, and broadly what this turns into is a discussion of how the buildings are used to define the public realm. How close are they to the street, for example? And in Old Town, I think all of you are familiar with the fact that the original buildings built before 1930, all the front of the building touched the property line. And then, uh, and it was sort of an unspoken, I don't think the county had any uh, ordinance that said the building has to touch the property line. That was the natural instinct throughout most of American history to get commercial buildings right up to the street, get your glass in the front, and get yourself close to your customers. The, in, the, in the Old Town case, the balconies and porches were built into the right of way, and then some years later, the county deeded that extra 10 feet of space back to the private landowner so that all those improvements were not on county property. Um, the, and what you get when you do that is a clearly defined street edge where the buildings help define the space of the street, that's in the photo. This illustrates on the left the Jefferson Corridor at the Stater Brothers site, and on the right another town in California. The, they're at the same scale, both streets are four lane arterials with parallel parking on the sides. And I think they both have mediums. You're doing one the right, Debbie. The, the Jefferson Corridor was developed during a period of time when defining the street with buildings was not the common practice. It's a post-World War II development. Um, and as such, what tended to happen were the idea of setbacks. That is, your building, in fact, is supposed to be set back a certain distance from the street as opposed to what we refer to as built to lines, which is to say that the building, in fact, has to come forward to a line that's very close to the street. The, the town on the right clearly was built before World War II, where the buildings, um, as in the old town and many small towns that you will have visited, um, all come close to the street. <clears throat> building form. Um, this could also be referred to as building massing, and I've just shown four examples of building forms. Um, and these are independent of architecture. Uh, a two-story block, a three-story block, a three-story block with a fourth floor that's set back from the street, and a three-story block with what we call a forecourt. It's a kind of court where it's carved out of it on the street edge. <clears throat> If you take those simple building forms, you can combine those together to create a streetscape. And right there is in 90% of American cities um, is where the buildings are close to the street. The, um, with very few building types, you can get a lot of variety. The, the third concept is frontage types. <clears throat> and this is separate from the, the building form. Frontage type is from the front face of the building mass forward into the street, there are different kinds of treatments and designs that you can create. The one on the left is what we call a shop front, and that's the most common in commercial areas where the buildings are close to the street. And often there are awnings and canopies um, attached to the face of the building. There's a little cross section below each uh, sketch. The second one is what we call a gallery. You see a lot of those in Old Town, and very common uh, coast to coast here. Um, and the next one shows a two-story gallery. You see that coming in two. The third one is the forecourt. So the forecourt kind of lives both in the world of building form and in the world of building frontage. Um, the third one is the arcade, typically the first floor set back, and the second floor um, hangs over it. For example, the Palomar Hotel and Old Town is an example of an arcade. You can walk underneath the second floor. And the third one, third furnace type is the stoop, which is primarily a residential furnace type. So if you combine building forms with these frontage types, 
for example, on the upper left, if you started with a three-story block and then you go down, you can say you can show the same block with a gallery. You go down again, and you see the same block with an arcade. Um, the most buildings, 90% of the buildings you'll find in, in urban America are, are these types of combinations. And then furthermore, if you combine different building forms with different frontage types attached to them, you can create, with very few elements, you can create very lively and very diverse kinds of buildings. Now again, notice this sketch, for example, could be architecturally, it could be a variety of um, Spanish colonial, it could be neoclassical, uh, it could be modern. This discussion is really kind of independent of architectural style. And that is a very important part of urban design and placemaking. We won't talk about that tonight. We'll, we'll touch that in a future uh, workshop. Now, based on what I just showed you, the one on the upper left is a shop front, in this case with a canopy. The left on the bottom shows a commercial building, a three-story block that has a three-story gallery at the far end, and then a two-story gallery a little closer. Upper right shows a building that has a two-story gallery on the far end and an arcade at the front end. And then lower right shows a kind of an upside-down arcade. It's, it's, I suppose, a two-story block where the second floor is pushed back from the top a little bit, and then there's a gallery in the upper, upper level. So with these very few simple elements, you can create a great deal of diversity and then if you add architectural style onto that, um, you get even more of So that's, that, that is one of the ways that I use when I'm looking at pictures of streets um, or when I travel to a place, I try to, try to sort of deep unpack it and say, okay, what's the basic building form? What are the frontage types? And then what's the architectural style that's attached to Okay, the fourth, fourth um, topic is streets. And these are the four um, issues I'll, I'll talk about. Street grids, the block size, interconnected streets, street types, and then some examples of four-lane arterials, which is what Jefferson Avenue is, of course. This is an image that shows the Jefferson Avenue study area on the left with an insert of Old Town at the same scale. It gives you a sense that, you know, Old Town is kind of a long walk um, in what it is sort of gate to gate. Um, Jefferson Corridor is like at least four of those long. And it really begs the question, um, uh, with such a large area, what are the opportunities to create different sorts of districts or different areas with different character along that whole two plus mile uh, length? The smaller blocks, traditionally, in the world of real estate, um, create more frontage, which create more opportunity for customers to walk by your front door. It tends to increase the value of the property. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Old Town it, it sells for the real estate price per square foot that it sells for, whatever that is this year. Um, and it begs the question, in the future, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years out in, in the Jefferson Corridor, is it, what are the opportunities to make smaller blocks? Is that desirable? And this is something that we're going to want you to think about and give us feedback on as we go forward. Another issue is wayfinding. Um, I'm pretty good at finding my way around Jefferson Corridor, but Old Town is, is it's real simple. Now, of course, it's quarter the size, so it's sort of not fair. But the street alignments in the Jefferson Quarter do not make it easy for first-time uh, visitors to find a way around. And that wayfinding uh, is an issue that needs to be thought about in the future. Here's a comparison at the same scale. So on the left is Old Town. And one of the ways we um, measure blocks is the, the actual dimensions of them. Old Town's 300 by 400 feet, and the, the walking distance around them. If you park 
want to walk around this lot, the old town lot size is, is very pedestrian friendly. Um, in the Jefferson Corridor, what I'll call the Stater Brothers block, uh, the perimeter is over a mile long and it's, it's 39 acres in size. Um, by contrast, what I'll call the right of way block, which is sort of behind there at the end of um, uh, Oberlin, um, is you know half a mile around and six acres uh, or so. Um, the the short the, the smaller block size is more pedestrian friendly, and this is part of this equation of the future of Jefferson Corridor in thinking about how pedestrian friendly you want it to be. The next slide shows the concept of interconnected streets, another discussion point for the future of this corridor. On the left is the existing condition. There's really only, there's strong north-south connectivity. Diaz, Jefferson Avenue, the freeway, Inez, and so forth. East-west, there's only three ways across at the moment. Winchester, Overland, and Rancho California. In the future, the city plans and I think you're aware of uh, the new interchange at Cherry on the north edge, which will in result eventually with the connection east-west. Um, the fact that Overland will continue across the creek to the west side, and then some uh, 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 another crossing down toward Rancho Way. The alignment of that one is unclear at the moment. Um, so the result in the future will be that instead of being kind of an island. North-South Island, Jefferson Corridor will be much more connected uh, horizontally east-west with with uh, the rest of the Temecula. And that begs questions about what is what kind of opportunities does that create for development? What kind of opportunities for uh, uses does that uh, tend to suggest? Okay, street types is another way we think about uh, designing uh, cities and towns and. Upper left is Jefferson Avenue under the existing conditions. It's four lanes with a paved median with a sidewalk that's next to the curb. The center one shows with what we classically refer to as parkway. In that case, there's, there's uh, grass and autumn trees in the median. Um, the sidewalks are away from the curb. There's a grass terrace between the sidewalks and the curb. It separates pedestrians from the cars. Um, the third one is Boulevard. And I don't think Jefferson Avenue will ever be a boulevard, but there may be opportunities in Jefferson Corridor in the future for a boulevard to exist. Lower left, there's two um, streets which are one way each direction, one with parking on both sides of the street, and the other with parking on one side of the street. And the lower left one is similar to Commerce Center Drive. Then there's alleys, which, are, which there are some private ones which we'll get to in the future. And then a new one we want to introduce, which is technically a parkway with what we call a slip street on either side. And that exists in, in numerous cities where the intent is to allow cars to get out of traffic, slow down and park, and make it easy for people to get to business. Now, there are many more street types, but I just want to uh, sort of uh, introduce the concept of street types. And as we go through this workshop, uh, we'll, be, we'll be exploring different kinds of street types that might be appropriate for Jefferson Avenue um, corridor. Okay, here are four examples of a four-lane arterial with parking on the side. Um, this, of course, is Jefferson Avenue. And I did a little cross-section on the bottom that shows uh, approximately what it looks like. In this case, you can see the buildings are set well back from the street. Here's one which shows two story, one and two story buildings placed close to the street. Very different character. Um, I think you can see a table uh, next, on the sidewalk there. The next one shows four to five story buildings fronting that same width of street. But in this case, it feels narrower because I think, in fact, the buildings, you can see that the ground floor is what I was referring to as an arcade. The first floor is set back from the street. I think that the, the parts of the building have actually been sort of brought forward, which tend to create a more enclosed um, streetscape. 
And the fourth one, uh, you know, uh, 12 story buildings. And, uh, um, there are lots of examples in larger cities uh, like this. So the real question is what we want to explore with you, and we want your input over time is what are the kinds of characters that Jefferson Avenue might want to have in the future along this way? Within two miles, you can do very different things. And I put up two slides, which probably neither, probably neither one is what should happen in Jefferson Quarter. Uh, this looks like a, a very wooded, um, almost residential street, and that's probably not what Jefferson Avenue uh, needs to be. The other one shows a very urban, tough kind of urban scene, and that's probably not what Jefferson Avenue wants to be. I would suggest that somewhere between these two pictures is a world that we need to explore over the next number of months. Think about what kind of character um, and how that character might change along the length of Jefferson Avenue. One other street opportunity. In Old Town, we explored the idea of a, a creek promenade that is a long creek um, a mostly pedestrian, maybe emergency vehicle access way that could give you access to buildings that actually looked at the creek, that looked west toward those great views of the mountains. And that might be uh, an idea to consider for the Jefferson Quarter. The lower left is a photo. The photo doesn't show it, but on the right is a creek. It's in a different city, of course. Okay. That's going to be a very brief sort of introduction to urban design and placemaking. And what I'd like to do is pause there before I uh, introduce the case study for Stater Brothers and see if there's any questions, uh, discussion, comments. And Pat will help me with uh, that. Right. And uh, Dale's going to walk around with the microphone too. If you, I, I think what, we, what we'd like to hear, Frank, is uh, what resonates with people right now, what they've seen, um, if they have questions or if you, if um, anything looks particularly appealing to you or not appealing to you for, for Jefferson Court. So, any thoughts out there? Because we're going to get into some real specifics with the, the case study and we'll have some things to talk about, but we, we'd really like your, your thoughts ahead of time as to, I know it's quite a bit to absorb all at once, but, but how about the street types? Yes? Uh, when I uh, am a builder, I'd rather talk to people on the street, you know, and so we go through the design process, and then when we take pictures of something that you like, and you say, you know, put that up, and then you copy it, because obviously we're in these cities, there's thousands of cities across the country, I mean, have you given, is there a city that you've looked at that you say this is the city that The um, representative from the Stater Brothers site um, sort of said something memorable, which he said, I wish we just had regular tenants. Had what? Regular tenants. And that regular was sort of, I think, a code word for desirable tenants, ones that you see in other parts of the city. And to your point that, that um, uh, there are many businesses Good businesses in yeah, Jefferson Quarter, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and there's, there's much more range, and, and you know the Stater Brothers, that whole complex is, is you know, uh, has had better tenants, and that trend is always kind of disturbing. Not that there's anything wrong with Salvation Army. No, we love the Salvation Army. But uh, it's the case in point, for example, in your type of business, what do you think would attract? like businesses, what kind of look and feel in the quarter? Well, you know, I'm trying to think of the economics to the direction mm -hmm. that we're going because everything's going to big box. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it, every every store that comes out is, is a bigger box and you have to travel to get there. So I really think the only way small businesses will ever be able to compete mm -hmm. in an, any kind of an area like this is they have to, there has to be something in it for them that 
they save their money. For me, that's something that should be able to walk to where you're going to go and not have to get into your car and drive to a big box. You are going to, but in order to sustain that many businesses in that area, you, so you're going to have to have a lot of people that are really living in that area that they said <coughs> Well, you know, in my view, whenever I want to uh, talk to somebody who really has an in-depth understanding of an issue, I end up in Jefferson Court. Whether I go to Haynes Hardware, or I go to Space and Space Supply, or I go to Fertilizer, uh, or I go to the key, the key uh, locksmith that I can't remember his name. He's the best guy in town. So, you know, so for commodity stuff, you go to the big box. And mind you, right now, Jefferson Quarter has a unique niche that it has uh, some specialties and in-depth knowledge on a variety of uh, uh, products which, which you can't get at. But it's not desirable for people yeah. to want to live in that area. <coughs> That's the now, the, re the residential, there's no, I don't think anybody, there's no residential in the whole area. And that's an issue which in the case study, uh, I will talk about. I think that's desirable. We heard that at the last uh, workshop that there was desire for that. I think there was one of the people and said. And there's a shop back here and yeah. then up here. Yeah. Uh, uh, recently we had a wind up in uh, LA. And uh, obviously the big trees come with big problems. Uh, one of the things I've always liked about Old Town was that they got rid of the power line got rid of the stuff that hangs over. The things that you know that you build today, but 20 years down the road, is nothing left anyway. So the, my premise is, is that one, anything over here is gonna be a pain. Even, even the street lights can be a pain, depending on how architectural they are and or how they play. And of course, with some of the ones that have a large hangout, the wind grabs them and tears them down. You've got a large tree, it comes down. Takes out the sidewalk, takes out Maybe a cable line is below the ground, water line, of course, gas line. Uh, one more thing that I want to mention about that corridor, though, is that you're always going to have that freeway off to your right or on the east side of it as you go north. Uh, two, I'm a sidewalk person. I love sidewalks. Obviously, it doesn't look like it, but I spend a lot of time on sidewalks. And most people will do, like, for instance, I go to Hanks. I don't go just to Hanks to pick up one screw. I like to walk to the store. When, and I remember when State of Brothers first moved to Temecula, you went there, but then you also went over to the next door over because they had something that was related or more of a specialized. And of course, since uh, State of Brothers moved out and moved out to the South, things have changed. Um, I used to go for boots. Uh, there was a boot store over there, and there was a couple other things that I used to go in there for. My, my whole thing is, of course, you have to have anchors, anchor story, as it's called, and at the time it served its purpose. Of course, I mean, I do, believe I do the Del Taco move in, and now that I do Del Taco, I spent many a lunch here as well. But my point is, is that aesthetics, I think, have a lot to do with it. But the same answer is, too. As you come down that same corridor going down towards Rancho California, uh, almost down to uh, McDonald's right now, which is getting refurbished, uh, no sidewalks. There's, I mean, it's kind of a bleak, big square block. Bianchi's gone, I think there's a, another company that's moved in there, but it's kind of a bleak, big grass, curb, and that's what I'm here for. I, I'm, I'm a sidewalk fan, and I dislike large, I think I find them dangerous. And that's something that you might want to put on your back of our hands is that don't look at it just as in today, but look at it as in 20 years ago. Or in my case, 40 years ago. Some of the things that we had now, I don't necessarily mean that we, we did as well a job, but I think if we would have thought about it in 20 years, how it progressed. So the point is plan for the longer term and also yeah. have things, uses that relate to each other, maybe not duplicate uses, but they relate to each other. That's what we'll get into next time when we talk about districts, like what works with what and what kind of identity can we have. And by the way, it was a large
large trees, do not water the parkway because that creates the shallow roots, which ends up and in the leaves. And we had a comment back there. Yeah, and I think the thing I would be looking at is flexibility for the future because the future of work is changing and will continue to change. The future of transportation is going to change. And I, I would say not to put ourselves in a box that's going to cost us a fortune to dig out of later. And, you know, that's a big issue that I'm sort of not trained in. So that'd be my long standing point of living here for 34 years. Um, I, I've seen where our, our community has done some outstanding things. And other things I've seen them kind of like get pinned in a little bit. Maybe then it sounded great then or whatever. But because we change so fast. So how far out are you also considering the next 50 years, the next 30 years, the next 20 years? I mean, 30 years, like I worked at that Bianchi building when it was in the heyday around here. And, you know, I drive by there today and it's sad because the whole area is depleted. But those buildings were built, they were substantial places. I mean, you know, they were nice places to work and they looked nice and the community was proud of that area. That was our employment. But somehow we outgrew it. And so I'm just looking at flexibility and the future of all the life issues that affect us. That's what I would be most interested and most concerned about. As we baby boomers move into the future and you know, have mobility issues and things like that, but that's one place where the residential, for example, comes into play. I just want to make sure you still understand there's still the desire for taller buildings. The three and four stories are nice, but I still think there needs to be focus on a 10, 12 story with maybe a residential parking included retail on the bottom. Other comments before we move on to the case study? Patrick? same time frame as, as uh, our old town developed. And then as you go east on, on uh, Colorado Boulevard, you actually see uh, more intense commercial and office development that in many ways could mimic the Jefferson Corridor. Um, and the one thing that's really revitalized that area, both the old Pasadena and the new Pas and the, the area development that occurred later was a variety of things. One being transit, there's a, there's a, uh, a rail line that goes through there. Um, and the uh, a strong business community in their old town. I mean, I think what we would like to see happen, and I think we're already seeing it in our old town, is that um, these communities develop in an organic fashion. The old town um, developed, and then as um, the, the uh, city went, grew up in age, the area to the north, the little Jefferson Corridor developed. So it's, it's much the same pattern, and um, I think the, uh, you know, we, uh, the different type, if you look at the buildings in Old Town, um, the older buildings, let's say the bank or um, the Kimeka Olive Oil building, those buildings were built, you know, they're coming up close to 100 years ago. And um, they've been many things during their life cycle. They haven't been the same thing that they were intended to when they were built. I would contend that a lot of the suburban development that is built in here as well as all over the country, that it's kind of like when you buy a new car and you drive it off the lot, well, it drops in value right when you drive it off the lot. And in many ways, the development um, that has occurred um, throughout Southern California, including Temecula, is once the doors are open, for when they first opened up, they basically became more obsolete as they've gotten older. Because a lot of the buildings that you see out there, um, unlike the buildings in Old Town, they can't necessarily be reused. Um, you see changing of tenants, and, and, and you go from um, credit tenants and, and, and national retailers into independents and, and more um, uh, kind of on the fringe type uh, because the property values go down. Part of that problem is, is if someone wants to come in and reuse a building, let's say the old Stater Brothers building, it's really difficult to re retrofit that building to either a residential or a commercial or some other building that, um, as opposed to the bank building, 
which again, it's been in the bank, it's been a restaurant, it's been a couple of restaurants, and we've seen that uh, one of the trends in a lot of urban areas is these old office buildings that are no longer successful, they're actually going in and retrofitting those office buildings as residential units. And um, because the buildings are pulled to the street, um, they have either parking behind or underneath, they can go in and build, and if you look at downtown LA, I mean, it's not much, it's not the same comparison, but they have a lot of vacant office buildings that now they are being retrofitted with residential, and it's completely changed the, uh, used to be you go to downtown LA, at night, you could shoot a cannon down the road and not hit anybody. Now it's a vibrant community, and the, and the thing that, that, that really drew that and, and improved the environment was bringing people in there that are living 24 hours a day, they're also working in the area, and it's not a place where everybody goes, works during the day, and then he goes on to the east side of the Temecula and then comes back at the end of the next morning. So I think, I think it's really important to look at what other communities are doing. I mean, we have our own um, flavor and identity. Um, we don't want to be like another city. We want Temecula to be Temecula. But I think we can look to um, what other cities have done, both good and bad, and, and try to you know, learn from the good things. Other quick comments, we can move on to the case study and then maybe get to the case. What I understand, uh, Bill, is, is the idea to, to continue to have your parking space where it's at or to bring the building forward? I mean, something like uh, we were saying about the Colorado and also uh, <coughs> Mission. I mean, that's in the street, it's, it's beautiful, but then all the buildings are right towards the, the street. Where here, it's very good. It's very good. Now, the, the very good question. It's a very tough question. And in the case study that I'll go through in a minute, you'll see a couple of responses to parking at high, when you get into higher densities. And clearly when you get above two stories, you've got to structure your parking unless you've got lots of open area. And with the land value, that tends to not, tends not to happen. So that, what do you do with parking is a, 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 one of the toughest things to solve. And I'll touch on a few uh, solutions and then in future workshops, I know that uh, the redevelopment scenarios of the parking will be addressed further. But I have a hunch from each workshop that the parking issue will come up. Um, we, what we can do is show you what other cities have done with this, you know, whether it's passing mm -hmm. like park, you know, I and um, uh, gas lamps in San Diego. And it took a few minutes to find the public parking. But I found it, you know, it turned out to be a block and a half from the restaurant, and we had it all worked out great. But um, so the combination of public parking and private parking um, is, is a very complex question. You know, in that restaurant, the valley park is 12 blocks of public parking. They give you a credit for stay. But if you don't think you stay less than one hour, the public ramp is looking three in. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's parking, you know, we all know it's phenomenally complicated. People make careers out of parking. Right. <laughs> One more minute. Yeah, I would just say the same thing for uh, myself. I look at downtown San Diego, where you've had a condo down there before, in the high rises down there, and I just want to key in on what he's saying. If you put a high rise in that area tomorrow, you would fill it with people that want to live in there, just because you're not looking at what's down the ground. You're up above and you're seeing what you have. If you do a, a, a low rise out there, going to take some effort to get people to move in there. And, it, and the whole key to making this thing work is getting people to live in there. The only people live in there, so the higher the better. Yeah, so let's go to uh, Ron. Yeah, Ron's found earlier, but the, the height of the building, um, as you may know, in certain areas of Jefferson Quarter, you go 75 feet, probably two stories. And that's all I've shown in the Study, but we want to hear from you and you know to, to these two comments if there is an interest and a desire to explore higher density we will explore that and that's why you're here tonight to, to look at what we have and respond with the direction let's explore that <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, the, the large corporates, you know, that are going to bring jobs to our community, which is what our community needs, is, you know, get back to life and quit commuting, is a huge focus in our community. And a lot of families 
deal with that issue, and I think it's a win-win for both situations. If you can incorporate some corporation, residential, parking, and, and retail in one, sorry to say, 12, 15, maybe 20 story building. <laughs> All right, good. Um, how are we on time, Fashion? We, uh, I think uh, well, we can meet West Coast every time, but we do want a chance to uh, delve into the case study. So, uh, everybody want to take a look at what might happen with State of River Site, just as an <coughs> idea, and then I think that will lend itself to some other ideas. So, uh, I think the slide thing is up to you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. All right, the case study. The idea of a case study is not to really show you a, a well thought out and you know, fully considered redevelopment scenario for this site. Clearly, it's, it's um, very, it's done very quickly. Uh, it's a concept sketch, and um, I did this really to, to sort of provide this for the mill. Um, put something in front of you tangible that lets us talk in a little more detail about what, what the impact of some of these issues would be. So, if you'll, you're, we're going to put on your table two drawings. You can ignore them for the moment because I will, I will, it, I, I have some preamble before we get to the sketching. Uh, but, um, the, again, the, the, per the slide on the screen. A quick recap of the four issues that I'm going to focus on, and again, there's quite that many that we would really consider, including you know, economics, marketability, etc. Um, okay, the Stater Brothers site, I think most of you are familiar with. It's at the corner of Jefferson and Overland. Um, I've rotated the view in this slide, so north is actually to the lower of the right, but it sort of fits on the screen there. Um, the red outline shows the two parcels that are owned by one party, and that's the party with which we were, we were uh, talking um, originally. The Salvation Army owns a piece, and the former Stater Brothers is uh, owned by a third um, entity. The vehicular access through the site, I think you're all familiar with the parking access drive, sort of a sort of a street that goes horizontally through the site um, and connects down to Jefferson Road and at Overland. And then behind the whole complex is a service drive, sort of an alley that circle, circulates behind. And then in addition, there are the, the blue circles indicate um, vehicular access off the streets to the site. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so there it is in its current form. Um, the first sketch, uh, which you have a copy of on your tables, um, takes the internal street that it, at the moment is sort of a parking, one side of the building is one side of the parking, turns it into a, a, a real street that loops around and joins Jefferson Avenue on, on sort of the north edge over here. So the, the internal street here, and then in an effort to <coughs> find a way to make this site really memorable and really striking when you're uh, both driving down Jefferson and when you've been here and you go away, I dropped in a plaza, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But I think on a project this size, you need some way to make it memorable and really striking. The, um, in addition, the uh, so the brown parts of the building. Okay. Um, so this is this is sort of alternate one, and apparently you have two copies of alternate two. <laughs> But if you'll, if you'll bear with me here. Um, in this case, the difference between this and the one you have now, these buildings are all brought right up to the street. Um, parking is in the middle of the block. 
Uh, also, with the buildings behind, you know, whatever shape the buildings would be, the parking would tend to be behind them. Now, if this was all a one-story project, everything could be surface parked, probably. However, I'm not proposing a one-story project for this exercise. Um, the next slide. Okay, this is where that reference came from. And to Roger's question, you know, what other places uh, do we know that, that we admire and we would like to see some up here? This is one that I admire, it's in Lake Forest, Illinois, and it was done in 1912. And on the left, you can see the train station from Chicago. Um, it was one of the first sort of suburban village centers. At the other end, on the right, it was the first Marshall Fields department store outside of the city of Chicago. And then there was this plaza with lots of on-street parking. And then between, in the middle of the blocks, there was surface parking. Um, so I just sort of grabbed that thing and dropped it into Jefferson Avenue for the exercise today. A couple of photos of um, the uh, Lake Forest Plaza. Um, and in the subject of placemaking, that we were touching on at the beginning, uh, this is generally recognized as a terrific place to go. It's memorable, it's distinctive. Um, you always want to stop when you drive by it. Um, which tends to result in the fact that there's interesting stores there, and it creates a synergy between the character of the place and the economic vitality. And that's, I think, one of the definitions of a good place. Here's a sketch, which, to Ron's question earlier, I intended to limit myself to the current 75 foot height, which is six stories. And, and I'm, I'm going to say it until I hear strong views like yours to explore higher density. Um, you can see the plaza uh, here, entrance off of Jefferson Avenue across the bottom. The buildings pulled up too close to the street with sidewalks and street trees and so forth. Um, you can see parking structures behind. Um, you can see four, five, six story buildings in the back. Um, and I'm showing, for example, on street parking, which for any of these buildings, any of these retailers to survive on Jefferson, they're gonna need a lot of parking. And frankly, I worry that just having street parking uh, may not be enough parking to support some of these retailers that are on the front. Um, which leads us to the next image, which you are amply provided with <laughs> in your tables. This one shows the concept of the slip street, which I discussed in the street type discussion. And in this case, if you're coming down Jefferson, you can, you can pull out traffic onto a slower street, slow down, and there's lots of uh, diagonal parking in front of retailers and stores there. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the prospect of retail success with this kind of a situation. If, if this is full, the key would be to make it easy to turn the corner and go into the ramp, and then an easy way to get out to your store again. But if you see the parking, it looks convenient, it looks easy to stop, and you think, well, maybe I can get a spot, I'm gonna pull in. Key decision is to get people to pull their car into close to your store. The okay on the top here I didn't mention at the end of the plaza is uh, an opportunity for some kind of anchor, whether it's a grocery store or a corporate office with 500 employees, um, whatever it might be. Okay, the next image shows a sketch of that arrangement. And here you can see the slip street. So these buildings have been shoved back from Jefferson Avenue and the slip street um, has been added uh, on both sides. Otherwise, the sketch, the sketch is the same. Now, the, in, this, in this one, I actually kept the, you see three-story buildings on Jefferson. They're kind of lowish. And then it gets taller back in the site. So that's one idea. That it could be lower at Jefferson, and as you got back, it could be much taller. 
And it begs the question about the character of that street where the taller buildings are. But before I comment on that, here's a picture of a slip street. Um, you can see a four lane arterial and very easy to pull off to the right and, and slow down and um, find parking. Um, <coughs> turns out there's sort of some slip streets in Jefferson Quarter, but not configured like this. And we'll, we'll get to those in a future case study. Okay, the internal street then. The internal street being the horizontal street called the name New Street here. Uh, one idea, uh, for example, is it could be completely residential. Um, this shows one, two, three, four floors of residential. Could be as high as you wanted. This one shows retail, commercial on the first floor with residential above. Uh, so those are sort of two models. Now, one of the challenges that Jefferson Quarter has is that you've got the mall with all the big retailers, the anchor store, and Jefferson Quarter probably will never compete head to head with the mall for retail. So it doesn't today, and it probably won't in the future. So the trick is to find a unique mix uh, that leverages the strengths of the businesses that exist now and the businesses in the future at Old Town, I mean, in Jefferson Corridor, to, uh, for it to succeed. I personally agree with the idea of mixing residential into Jefferson Corridor. That is one of the issues we want you to keep thinking about and to voice your opinion. So the first workshop, we had a number of different opinions, and uh, um, we look forward to more tonight. <coughs> Couple slides and then I'm done. One other issue in urban design is that at the end of a plaza or at the end of a street, it creates a unique opportunity for people to direct people's eyes and to do identification with architecture and signage of important businesses. So in this case, there's sort of three logical places that have terminated views. And the terminated view issue relates to the fact that um, in streets that, that, that continue almost you know, to the horizon, you tend to just get drawn down and you, you want to hit the gas pedal and you keep going. You drive by all the shops. Um, I think instead, in, in, in Jefferson Quarter, we should need to look for the opportunities to do those terminated views. Now, clearly, you can't terminate Jefferson Avenue. But streets that are perpendicular or par to, parallel to it, I think you can. Okay, so let me stop there. And um, again, this the, the spirit of this um, case study is not to propose a fully fleshed out scheme, but to do something very quick, which uses those concepts I discussed at the start. And the intent of it is to put something in front of you for you to react to, either positively or negatively. And Frank, can we put up case study number one? That way people will have that to look at here and a one to look at on the table too. Because I know there are some uh, some distinct differences between the two that, that oh, you pointed true. out. There you go. There we go. Yeah. Slip street or no slip street. Right. So what do you think are the strengths of the, the various concepts or, or aspects that you've seen here? What, what, what do you like, what do you think would you know, help enhance um, both Jefferson Corridor? And this is just an example of things that could be done, but uh, what do you think are the strengths of either the first concept or the second concept? Yes, Larry. Well, I think, and I don't want to control what I want to Oh, okay, we'll, we'll not. <laughs> I'm probably pulling it out. Uh, I think both concepts are, are good concepts. Uh, I like the slip street idea uh, to pull the parking in for the potential retail on Jefferson. Uh, I think, though, having any parallel parking on Jefferson or Overland is, is fatal. Uh, people cannot parallel park today <laughs> at all unless they have the automated parallel parking. Uh, and the internal street might be okay, but I'd actually rather see you go on the internal street to go to angled parking on, on each side in the opposite. I like the resident, I, I, I agree 100%. There's gotta be a resident, a heavy residential component over here. Mm -hmm. A critical mass of people for the evenings and the use and use of those, those retail services. So I like the concepts. Uh, I mean, be aware of this on this particular 
their property, but be aware there is a perch groundwater table there due to the fault zone that runs along the west side, so you will not be able to do parking, you know, parking garages without major pump systems. Right. Mm -hmm. So it'll have to be part of construction with the program. How about others? Yes. I love it. I love it. Love it. Yeah, I do. What What do you love about it, though? Uh, I, I think it's a great. I mean, I like the concept. I like the site in particular because I'm very aware of that particular area, and uh, I think it's a really good starting point. It's a real good example. I, I like the, the feel of it, and I could see it as a place that I would want to be and, and even live. Really. Okay. Can I ask a question? Um, from this camera, I'm going to ask three questions and I'm ask for a show of hands. I'm going to ask who thinks this is too dense, too much, too high to build, who thinks about it right, and who would like to see taller buildings built. So, who, who, show of hands, who thinks it's too high? Too high. That's shown. Okay. A couple of hands. Oh, three. Three. Who thinks it's about the right height? Who would like to see taller buildings? In the back. In the back. Mm -hmm. Just as you pointed out. Yeah. Right. Okay, so so the idea of if there are taller buildings, they're set back from Jefferson Avenue. Mm -hmm. And the idea of it's about to be Jefferson Avenue. So you have the best of all worlds, really, that way. Well, uh, uh, yeah, and then, uh, hi. is it Leticia? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I like the uh, bush study, uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, if you go to the uh, like, uh, uh, forest area, Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong, or whatnot, probably we can create a two-meter site easily, 1,000 to 2,000 DU, while utilizing ground floor for the shopping line. So if you create that much mass, let's say, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 units, we we'll create three home per acre, which is a place of uh, three to six thousand. The community says, you know, six thousand is a lot of people on it. Itself will generate enough activities and buying power of commercial. So you don't have to compete head to head with a mall, rather, you're supporting those local people and bring some specialty shops, will support itself. So, in their regard, higher density will create enough mass, and that mass will help build the community itself. What's interesting is that in the city of Temecula, I think there's very few places where you can have this conversation. And that's what's neat and particularly exciting about the city of Florida, is that it's, it, in its evolution, it's sort of ready to be reconsidered. And I think Personally, I've done consulting in Hong Kong and in Singapore, and I've seen the kind of density that, that nobody blinked at in, yeah. in Asia. Yeah, you know, also, I think it's a great opportunity for the landowners. Supposedly, city is not doing this. Landowner tried to do something like that. You know, like everybody will kill right away. You know, planning commissioner will kill, city council will kill. <laughs> but because we are building up, you know, really a nice study here and provide a specific plan or whatnot. I think it is a great opportunity yeah. really we can create a city within a city. Good. And, and I, I'm a business person um, in addition to whatever else you see tonight. And what interests me a great deal is when we get to the workshop that addresses the economic issues and the market issues, um, I think all of us would be very interested to, to, to hear the logic that relates to density and what that turns into in terms of business Especially in this particular environment. So, Patricia, and then do we have others? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, last communities, you know, higher density is better. Like I said, you are creating bigger mass on it. Is it financially feasible? That's a different story. You know, you can build up five, six story, all, all of a sudden, building costs really jumping up. So, that you have to study on it. Thank you. I was going to say that in some areas on the rooftops, they have uh, businesses, parks, tennis courts, different things. So when you're looking from a higher rise building, you're looking for something aesthetic and it provides other square footage for other activities, which is lots of fun, whether it be restaurants, smaller shops, pools. You know.
Yeah, that's that whole green roof, roof concept. I was in Boston overlooking the big dig, and uh, all of a sudden there were these beautiful gardens on top of these buildings. So good point that you can get a lot of green uses that are up in the air as well. Other more interest added. Uh, one more thing I'd like to bring up. In concept, it looks great. It looks new and it's exciting. But imagine it in 20 years. Now, I've been to Irakuni, I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to Panama, which is a new city. Literally in 20 years, it's a brand new, huge city. My concern is it looks good up there, but in 20 years, what does it look like? And it starts getting a little tenement type and getting worse. Are we talking all apartments? Are we talking condos? That's something else that needs to be addressed. Yeah, so basically you're asking what will age gracefully, what kind of development can we have that will continue to be adaptable, such as some of that development 100 years ago was. Jay? I grew up in Kansas City, which has an area called the Country Club Plaza, which is virtually exactly what you see there, with a mixture of residential structures up to 8 to 12 stories that was built in the late 30s and through the 50s, which is a prime example that anybody could look at to see how that ages and what it looks like. And it's still uh, probably one of the more viable and original uh, open space, commercial retail office space uh, developments in the country. And would be a, an excellent example for you to use as a case study. But as Larry indicated, um, you really have to create the critical mass here. I mean, we've been involved in so many of these types of developments. Yeah, the Jefferson Corridor right now really doesn't have an identity, and that's what needs to be established. And you need to create that initial mass, and you have to have the, re you know, uh, without the retail like, and the uh, residential component, you know, I just, I, I wouldn't see this as a successful project without the residential. What's the name of that project? Uh, Country Club. Country Club Plaza in Kansas City. That's good, bringing things from other areas that all of you are familiar with as well. Yeah, Ken. Now this is just one piece of the whole Jefferson Corridor, right? So are, are we talking about this concept on all of those pieces? or And then how much is this concept the same as what we already have in Old Town? And are we going to be redoing that? and finding vacancies here in another 10 years once the unit swears off. Yeah, that, that's a good point because that's one of the things that we wanted to bring up uh, even tonight was how you think this kind of concept would relate to the rest of the development in the corridor, what other kinds of concepts. Like Main Street right there. Like yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah, that's it's pretty similar. Actually, even the parking is pretty similar to the uh, Civic Center. <laughs> No surface. No, okay. What, what do all of you think? Uh, other comments about this this particular case study or, or these these concepts here? Yeah. I just want to say that I think the direction is very very good. I'm an architect in, in the downtown area. My name's Gregory Hong. I also serve on the planning commission for the area. I really always admire how connected has progressed in the commercial venue and so the case of two cities. And I think we know what's doing pretty good. So, but I, I'm all, I'm a big fan of mixed use, higher density. I think the Catholic has a good idea. Mimic in uh, Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, one of my favorite streets in Southern California. But I think the, the vibrance that something like this could create on this side of town would help to shift the direction that Sarupi has taken it toward the wine country. So, I just want to add that, you know, I didn't hear much talk about it, but the link between the mall, this development, the creek, old town, and the pedestrian type of scenario where people, if this is a dense mixed use development of condos, apartments, whatnot, that people can drive, bicycle, or walk without worrying about automobiles because that's what how many of the problem. So I think this is a, is a really good, I'm really impressed. And, I was grateful that people were actually thinking about this kind of stuff. Gregory, question for you since you've got the experience. What would you see as how this type of development could relate to the rest of the corridor or maybe other concepts or pieces of this that might help uh, you know, connect the corridor? Well, this, is, this is one of the larger pieces of property that we have, have to work with. And I think 
it's a, a great opportunity to, to, to make a, it's a catalyst and you can have other nodes within the area that relate to this that aren't as dense and still have the same attributes. And I don't know, I just, I think this would be a good progress right here. This, this, is, this piece of property definitely, of all the property is connected, this is the one that needs a, a shot in the arm. So uh, the bottom line is it was good choice as, a dem as a, one of the first demonstration sites to, to bring up. So uh, other thoughts over here, yes. Over here, yeah. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Luann Palmer. I work for Grubbinell's commercial real estate firm. And I, this design is really a very amazing. It's a great place to start, especially such a dead area in Jefferson uh, from a commercial perspective. Um, I do agree with almost everyone in here that stated that a residential component is essential in here. Um, also, my experience has been with in commercial real estate office and retail, that smaller office space that wouldn't compete with Colonnade Mall would be essential. So I think that would be a huge successful component to this. And also, Pat, um, before we leave, I'd like you to address some, some incentives new business incentives because I agree that we need new business in here mm -hmm. to help create and do to make Glenn and your data to help support this idea. Thanks. And I think probably uh, Patrick and uh, and Frank can probably talk to that a little bit later as well and, and maybe even Frank so uh, there's uh, there's three cities that come to mind that I can think of that with the slip street uh, parking like Carlsbad, the side streets of Carlsbad, you can easily park you can get to a restaurant, you can get through, there's antique stores and art galleries, and it's kind of a, a success model, uh, and you can easily park up and down the side streets. Um, also, the Solano Beach uh, Design District there, that's a whole corridor with easy parking, and because people are drawn to that on the weekends, it's a real busy location. And then also, I was just thinking up in the Riverside around the Mission Inn, they actually have streets that are completely blocked off, which really draws the pedestrians to all the commercial. There's no residential, but the, the commercial businesses all seem to be thriving there because it's closed off to all car traffic and it really drives the people's attention to Carver Gate. Yeah, that's location. Okay. Uh, Jeff, 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 Jeff. Uh, I grew up in the Pasadena, Arcadia area, and so I've, I've personally witnessed uh, but the redevelopment of, of both of those cities, uh, especially you know Colorado, you were talking about, you know, what's it going to look like 20 years? Well, I remember when uh, Colorado was seedy and awful, and you wouldn't even want to go down there. And really, what they did is just, uh, you know, started bringing in some stores. Now, don't ask me how they did that in restaurants. But they kept the uh, integrity of the buildings, and I think that's a key component if you want longevity. What you give the character, if it has a uniqueness, you can always refresh it, because it'll probably go up and down in business cycles. But if it has a core um, design integrity, something you know, dramatic, interesting, whatever, that you can keep, then you can always kind of clean it up and give it a facelift. Um, um, you know, they did it there. Um, so anyway, Let's and trees. Are, are there any parts of this corridor that you would see as, as uh, wanting to kind of preserve the, the look of it here? To preserve the look? I don't know, we had a look. <laughs> no, but you know, I, as much as this gentleman is, is not in favor of, of trees, I'm in favor of greenery because I think that gives the ambiance and the character of an area, whether it be you know high rises up whatever, you need the green in order to give you the peace and the coming. I mean, that's why people move to neighborhoods and pay big bucks is to have the green. And I think businesses too, um, you know, it can't just be asphalt. Yeah, it, it may be an issue of the type of green having a mediated a streetscape issue in Pasadena itself. I know that there's a lot of, of controversy over trees. No figs. No, no figs. Yes. Oh. I think the uh, the test site there is a good start. I, I still leaning back into the whole district concerns me. It's a big area. And there's a lot of diversification in now, and the streets set up are set up in such a way that some flow together, some don't. But I think we need to come back and look at the whole area, and then maybe 
its staff and the consultants to look into like pods that are that maybe have certain themes that can adequately park and have a walking area, but to walk from all the way down to the north might be problematic, but we need to see what the whole area looks like, how we break it up. We're not gonna be able to have the whole area like that. It's not gonna work. It's got to have, it might be an area financial district, might be a hospital section, it might be several areas like this. I think we gotta get back and look at it in, in a complete, just get a broader scope. I, just a curious curiosity. I, I, most of you are familiar with what's been going on in Old Town. Um, and the, uh, we, we developed uh, with the redevelopment agency about 150 dwelling units. Um, and I'm just curious, how, how, how dense do you think those projects are? Um, dwelling units per acre. In Old Town. How dense, how, how dense do you think those are, like, <coughs> units per acre? Because they are right now, 25 30. No, they're actually 60 units to the acre. And, and I think the reason why I bring that up is um, these are projects that basically, um, the, the way the specific plan for Old Town is written, it doesn't actually have a specific density. It says you meet these development code requirements, and you can put as many units that will fit on that site. And the units that we've assisted in developing um, are over 60 units of the acre. And so I, I think what the, when we tell people that, they're really surprised because they walk by these buildings. Some of these buildings are three and four stories, mainly, well, mainly three story. And uh, so the whole issue of density, which often is very controversial, when people look and feel at projects that are higher density and they realize that the, you know, they're, they're not kind of the, the stereotype of what you would think, people become more comfortable with that. So I think the you know, density in Old Town, it's good to hear, or in uh, Jefferson, it's good to hear that there seems to be widespread support for residential, and, um, and I think we started that process here in Old Town. Um, if I could ask two final questions, and I'm gonna be quiet. First question is, um, do, does this case study method seem to be effective? Yeah, that, that was the intent is to give something sort of tangible. Even if it's wrong, at least it gives us something tangible to focus on. So um, as such, uh, there's, a, there's several other case studies that we're, we're um, looking at um, in the Jefferson Corridor area, and we'll bring those forward in future workshops. buildings in Temecula. And if you take a look at uh, San Diego, those high-rise buildings did not go in until the, uh, what, the 2000, 2001, 2002, when all these buildings went up. Those buildings right now are pretty much full. Of course, we have a flexibility with the accounts. However, there will be no doubt that people will buy condos if they're in a high-rise building, they have the nice views, a little bit to the Duluth, and then you have the East Olympic, but it's close to the freeway, people like that. And it'll give you a feeling of, of, of being in a, in a city that is really cosmopolitan, which obviously, it doesn't exist here in the metro. So if I can, um, it sounds like a future case study to explore a higher density residential cosmopolitan. Like, there you go. Yeah. 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 So I, that's the idea that you're missing. Okay, Dave, so we'll, we'll continue to develop case studies, and if there are landowners who we haven't spoken with who would like to volunteer to be subjects for uh, case studies on their property, uh, please see us afterwards. Uh, yeah, especially if you have one that could accommodate a high rise, right? I'd like to answer her question. Why she asked the city why I like to Just three decades ago, the people that have been living here burned this project to the state because they wanted nothing but grasslands and horses. So we've come a long, long way since those real briefly, historically speaking. When we got the Urban Bank Building approved, it was a major fight. And there were four folks. And it required a zone change. And there was a county office that said, no, you can't do that. And they 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 said, no, you can
another day, you're pre-sitting this. In order to go above 75 feet, you had to do a zone change specifically for the seasons of 75 feet. And, and, and that was a major fight back in about 80, 86, 86, when we when that was approved, we said it was approved. So we had a over that. And, and that, that's the mode. And it's been the mode, really, for areas. Uh, it was a square area ratio in the height limitation. Okay, if I may, one more um, question and topic that I would want you to think about as we go forward, and then I'm going to honest time and put this thing down. Yeah, because we do have questions the, here too. The, this scheme shows two smaller blocks. These blocks are about a little bigger than old town blocks. They create lots of edge. They create um, valuable frontage, which means the land prices tend to be higher. And it begs the question, I did this to sort of get you guys to think about, do smaller blocks, do you think smaller blocks are desirable in the Jefferson quarter? And then we don't know where they're going to go or where they can't go at this point. But it's a smaller, this is a smaller block. Yeah. So I, we want you to continue to think about, and if, if there's sufficient interest and support to exploring creating smaller blocks, in future case studies, we could do take a larger area and explore ways of creating smaller blocks. We're not doing that yet because we want to hear from you and gauge your, your comfort level with that. So maybe on the comment cards, uh, if you have thoughts related to that, uh, be appreciated. Yeah, actually that's related to a kind of follow-on question that we had too as well. So Leticia, I know you had a question. Well, I'm just uh, curious, something that Larry said, I guess. Um, do we know if we can build high rises there? Will the land support it? I mean, we've had so many issues with um, settling and they pull out water and everything starts to crack. And for those of you that lived here, I mean, can we do this? As an engineer would say, you can do anything if you have enough money. Is right. that it? <laughs> Do we have any more thoughts about some of the, in, including the upsides of the concepts you've heard tonight? Are there other like weaknesses or areas that you think you heard about? You know, is it is it seismically safe? Safe? Is there a, is there a ground what they call a groundwater issue here? Can it feasibly be done? And the engineers answered yes, yes, it can be done, just like tunneling under the English Tunnel or whatever it is. Anything can be done. But that's what this is all about, is looking at ideas and then looking at the land use feasibility, the economic feasibility, the acceptability, but also the buildability of these things. And I know we have a lot of architects and engineers in the room here, but we also have some experts on the team. I think, Frank, you dealt with a few uh, issues yourself in, in your development. So are, are there any uh, weaknesses here or anything that you'd like to look at or have considered in, in future workshops that, that you'd like to be explored in more, more depth. We heard about the uh, economic feasibility of some of these ideas. Um, we heard about, uh, Andy, are there other things that we heard about that we'd like to explore? Yeah, because we, we heard about uh, concepts that could work on this particular site because there there is land that's an opportunity. There are a lot of other opportunity or demonstration areas, but are there uh, certain clusterings that you'd like to see of like and like or diversity or like groupings of things that we could consider in future workshops about? You know, sometimes we talk about districts or we talked about perhaps a creekside district or an educational uh, grouping or something like that. Are, are there specific uses that you'd like to see uh, considered in the future to, to group together or complement each other? I'd like to see more regional parks. So if there's any space that can be devoted to 
putting in a park and these citizens in the living area could utilize on the weekends. I think that would be something I'd like to see. And that's something that actually we kind of heard about some of the first workshop was just that there needs to be more sort of a connectivity, open space, maybe some bikes, uh, play fields, parks, things like that. Other concepts? Is there any discussion about um, fixing the, the Any discussion about fixing um, the flood control channel? <laughs> what are we going to do there? Yeah, actually, uh, you're going to agree. Phase one, which was the area south of First, or, uh, First Street, that was completed about three or four years ago. The problem is there is a, a plan to improve the area at Creek. It would be basically be a uh, naturalized improvement that would, that would increase the, the, um, the, the flow and avoid and eliminate some flooding issues that have occurred with the uh, um, area at Creek. Um, the, uh, we've been working with the federal government, unfortunately, um, given some of the natural disasters that have occurred around the country, um, the, uh, there hasn't been funding to do what the, the phase two of Marietta Creek basically is from First Street all the way through Old Town up to Winchester. And um, while well, we've, we've been working with the city of Marietta, that we may actually um, abandon trying to work with the federal government and actually work with Riverside County Flood Control District and the two cities to actually fund um, those those improvements. So those are those are that's a high priority. <coughs> the phase two, which is basically the Rivers Project Area boundary, uh, the the uh, uh, phase one or the class one bike lane, which is on the east side, the west side of the creek, that'll be replicated on the on the east side of the creek. Um, it'll go from basically all the way down to. Uh, Pooch Alton and First Street, all the way through Old Town and then back to Winchester. And it'll actually connect at, um, is it Empire Creek or? Um, um, Santa Gertrudis Creek, which will take you basically to the east with a class one bike lane. Um, so th that's a huge priority for this area. The other, to answer one of the questions about open space, um, the area, kind of the large green area that you see in the northwest um, part of the, of the, the district, that is a, uh, uh, that's owned by the Riverside County Flood Control District. It's basically a detention basin for um, Muriat Creek in what weather years where the volume of water that comes through that will actually flood that area. Um, the plans are that um, the, the flooding would only occur maybe at a 100 year flood stage. So there are many years that there's not rainfall sufficient to flood, flood that area. So the plan is to actually turn that into a sports park where you would have ball fields and you know soccer, baseball fields that could be used in that area um, in the in the where we don't have we have normal rainfall or in during drought periods, and also directly across from um, where that park would be or the detention pond would be a transit center, uh, which would be a transit center that would be a lot of folks commute south of San Diego. Uh, there's a big demand for park and ride. Uh, that would be one of those facilities that would be um, uh, located in the north part of the project. But again, here we have that's a that's a major priority. Uh, we think that in the next three to five years, we should be able to um, cobble together the funding to do the phase that would go through this part of town. And we got Thank one you. more comment, and then in the future, uh, we'll be looking at some specific districts and how we can group things together. And uh, got. Uh, more to add, and then Katie, I know you have some really exciting images to share with people and, and show, so. Two things, one is um, revisiting my statement earlier in the evening about the future of work, because work is going to change in the future. And I would say that I think a definite consideration for uh, internet and uh, facilitating that and uh, for you know, what is the internet going to be later or anything like that. So I would definitely think of that and therefore there's infrastructure. And the other item in the back of my mind, I keep thinking about it and I've heard some negative things going on recently, so I don't know where it's at now, but what about our transportation corridor? Wasn't there supposed to be a train running through here? And has that got something to do with Jefferson or that side of the freeway or up on the mountain? What is, what's going on with that? Does that affect this particular project? Well, the, the California High Speed Rail project, um, which is in the planning stages right now, um, and would be tremendously expensive to build. 
The plan is, is that there would be a station in Murrieta. It would not be in Temecula. Um, Metro Rail is coming down as far south as Paris within the next 18 to 24 months. Eventually, there will be a Metro Rail station down here that will take people north, but that's probably at least 10 to 15 years away. And nobody knows where that is. Knows no. where what is it? Uh, station. No. Oh, that would be, there'd probably be a station in Murrieta. Um, oh, Elsinore, Murrieta, and Temecula. It wouldn't go any further south than Temecula. Well, if it's Temecula, does it have anything to do with this project? That's my Well, it would, it would look, we'd look at that because based on the transit center where it would be located would be how you could extend those rail lines. Obviously, from the city of Temecula standpoint, um, a lot of the activity that's occurring on the west side of the freeway is important. We'd like to uh, see that station be centrally located so it would not only benefit Residents live on the east side, but also the businesses on the west side, and where the residents. And now, Katie, you've got some examples to show us, don't you? I do. Um, Frank gave a really great overview of urban design, um, and additionally, this workshop was on placemaking. So we wanted to quickly cover some placemaking elements. Um, quickly with some images to allow you to react and give us some more feedback based upon the pictures that we put together. Um, so just kind of covering the elements of placemaking, they include the public realm, which as Frank talked about, you know, the streets, um, the buildings, um, sidewalks, public plazas and paseos, trails, recreation areas, and open space, which I know a lot of you have mentioned, signage and gateways, um, which kind of relates to, for, um, I, excuse me, signage and gateways, which um, would allow for us to create a unique identity for the area, the application of public art and the mix of uses, and all of these elements can be combined together to create a unique sense of place. So jumping into some of the images, um, this is a photo of the Civic Center Plaza right outside here in Old Town. As you can see, it's an open space that can be both um, passive and active with the Steve Miller Band concert that we did have um, out in front of the Civic Center Plaza. Um, pedestrian paseos and cafes. Um, would you want something like this within the SETI area? Public art um, and the application of landscaping materials, boat, um, fountains and water features. Another plaza which is located in front of the Promenade Mall. Um, an outdoor seating area for pedestrians just to kind of provide a gathering space and a unique place. Um, this is a plaza out behind the theater, which can kind of provides a nice pedestrian refuge. Sam Hicks Monument Park and thinking about open space within the study area. How do you kind of envision that within the Jefferson Avenue? Um, bike trails, open spaces, parks, and utilizing signage to create a unique identity, again, kind of um, relating back to the historic 395 corridor. Median signs, our gateway, which is an old town. Um, some interesting gateways with um, neon lighting. And this was Cedros Avenue, as someone mentioned before which kind of is a unique place. Public art, um, which we can see here. So are, are there any things that you find particularly appealing that you'd really like to see replicated in, in the corridor? Not the big trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of this is, it's, it's very nice, but it's more towards the end of the project that we're looking at. And, and I think any developer that puts a building up nowadays would have the treatments proper to the area. So this is very nice, and it's nice to see the examples, but I think like the gentleman over here was saying, we need to stick to the broader focus of what's the area you're gonna be, rather than you know how we're gonna make it look nice, because I think everybody can make it look nice now. So the idea is to have identities that are applied at the time after we got our districts identified, after we got our basic sense of what the form of the buildings is, what the uses will be, but these are 
really exciting images that are actually right in our backyard, aren't they, Katie? Yeah, yeah. Roger. Uh, yeah, I really like the concept of doing something along the creek bed. Uh, we were up in uh, Portland, not too long ago, and we've done some really nice things along the uh, river banks and the mm -hmm. cuts in, they have some nice parks, and you can put trees Uh, it's pretty unique to have this kind of uh, continuity of open space that, that Patrick was talking about, where we've got a lot of opportunity for connectivity of trails and, and again, creating a real identity along that creek. Exactly. Yeah. And getting, again, that signage that can identify this as a real, there, there, a real place. So uh, the next steps are that uh, we're going to uh, come back to you with, uh, with another workshop next month and uh, again, really appreciate all of the uh, all the thoughts. And by the way, you have your comment cards again at the table and we really appreciate your uh, filling those out. And uh, they're, they're here and if you don't have one, uh, the staff has some that they can pass out to you. Oh, you want to hold up your hand if you don't have one at your table and you'd like one? Pardon? Can you scan the email? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can either leave them behind tonight or... I wanted to oh, answer. Yeah, there's information. Uh, Andy reminded me. He's the uh, one who's organized on this. There's information at the bottom, uh, the email, and also the telephone number for your comments there. And uh, I think, uh, Patrick, we've got yeah, a lot uh, of good um, talks tonight. This lady over here asked about what kind of incentives the city can provide. Um, I think that's an important question. Um, the, uh, the, the Probably the most um, important thing that the city can provide is to create an infrastructure that will support um, this level of development. And that means um, looking at sewer capacity, water capacity, as well as roads and, and uh, utility connections. Um, the city of Tomeco has a, has a great track record in terms of building infrastructure. Um, I think part of the, uh, a huge part of the Old Town revitalization was started with the city investing in uh, infrastructure to um, create an environment that was business friendly. Um, the other thing that we've done recently in Old Town is we've adopted a new specific plan for Old Town and we've done what's called a Program Environmental Impact Report. And we, we uh, through this EIR, we basically took a, a worst case scenario as if you built out the plan, we actually went through this exercise where we figured out the maximum amount of square footage that you could build in Old Town. And then we identified mitigation measures to mitigate that development. So what happens is, is when every project, any new projects come into Old Town, their environmental um, review has already been done. And what we, that can save, you know, several months up to a year to two years in terms of your, um, um, your project, and as most developers know, time is money. And a huge incentive, even though we may not be able to provide direct economic incentives, by speeding you through the process and allowing you to go through the process and get under construction is a huge incentive. Um, the way, part of the problem of giving direct incentives is that if the city or the redevelopment agency provides incentives to private properties, um, it triggers what's called prevailing wage which means that when you do construction, it has to be a, it has to be a union a prevailing wage job. Any, any time that we, our money touches private development, that occurs. The only exception to that is affordable housing. So what we try to do is, and what we will hope to do in the Jefferson Avenue area is similar to what we did in Old Town. Let's look at ways to, through the regulatory process, that we can make it more efficient to get through that process. I don't mean we're gonna approve everything that comes in, um, if you get a chance and you go onto our website, there's also a link to the Old Town specific plan. You can see kind of a, what that, what a specific plan would look at. Um, it, it hires, it, it includes highly detailed requirements and standards and uh, design guidelines. The, 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 the um, agreement between the city and the, and the private development community is you meet these standards, we'll get you through the process in an expeditious fashion. And I think what most of the developers will tell you is that's a huge incentive. Um, and we've seen that happen in Wolfhound uh, just in the last five years. 
And Patrick and Bob, though, I think that you can testify that this, this actual process, right, this group today and this group that's going to participate in the workshops are the ones that really can help form the bones of what that specific plan will be and what it says and what it allows and, and the incentives. And uh, I think Frank's given us some good uh, food for thought here and, and ideas, and I think everybody looks forward to seeing what comes out next. And, and also next, um, in the future, when we start defining what these districts really are, you know, what the like and compatible uses are, what different areas might look and feel like, and, uh, and also what kind of infrastructure might be required or needed to support these, because like Patrick was saying, and I think those of you in development know that infrastructure can either make or break a project, and that can also be that and time delays and approval processes can be some of the most expensive things that have to, have to uh, go on with the project. So, Craig, yes? Mr. Yu asked an interesting question. Um, is this area a redevelopment area? It is a redevelopment area. Um, the, uh, the entire project area is within the, re the uh, Macula Redevelopment Area. Um, redevelopment is going through some major changes. Um, the governor one, wants to eliminate redevelopment, and in fact, um, there's a case pending before the Supreme Court which will um, decide whether or not the law that was passed back in June <coughs> is constitutional or not. So, we that's a huge tool. I would say that probably, um, well, I could just list off a laundry list of capital improvements that have been. The interchange for um, Winchester, which um, uh, allowed the mall to be developed, was done through redevelopment dollars. The Overland Bridge, um, the Main Street improvement, or uh, Old Town Front improvements, uh, this parking structure over here, um, basically any arterial that you drive on in the project area was funded through redevelopment. And there's a high probability that that won't be going away. However, we hope to work with um, our state legislators to look at some kind of alternative infrastructure financing. And we, we've gotten some good feedback from um, the folks in the legislature that even though redevelopment may go away, the state's going to try to provide some incentive or local, um, because otherwise, unless the cities can build infrastructure, a lot of these things that we're talking about can't be done. Okay. Well, with that, we'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this was, I think, another uh, terrific discussion. Uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you sometime next month at the next workshop. And we'll keep you posted via uh, notices and website. Thank you.